I am Loyal Jones, the person for whom the Berea College Appalachian Center was named. I'm grateful for the honor of having an educational center named for me, but I know that several people have come in here and asked, who in the world is Loyal Jones? So let me tell you something about me and my gratifying but somewhat haphazard career. I was born in western North Carolina in the cradle of surrounding mountains, mostly named after our Cherokee neighbors, Unaka, Snowbird, Tusquiddy. My parents, George Alec and Cora Morgan Jones, were tenant farmers. I was born on a farm in Cherokee County and grew up on another in neighboring Clay County. I count it a blessing that my family, with seven children, had strong religious and family values, and that my two communities prized honesty, personal relationship, and cooperation. I suppose the schools I attended were mediocre, but we had several good teachers and a traveling county library, and I discovered the pleasure of reading. At first, the Western novels of Zane Gray, Max Brand, Ernest Haycox, and William McLeod Rain. But when we moved near the John C. Campbell Folk School, their library offered the works of such writers as Mark Twain, Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, Booth Tarkington, William Soroyan, and Robert Louis Stevenson. I graduated from Hayesville High School in 1945, just before the end of World War II. After graduation, I joined the U.S. Navy following the bend of my uncle Will Jones, a career Navy chief, and my two older brothers, Garnet, who served on a destroyer in the Pacific campaigns, and Willis, a merchant marine ship's mate. After training at Norfolk, I was assigned to the USS Missouri, back from the signing of the peace treaty in Tokyo Bay. As a fireman, I stoked the furnace on one of the four engine rooms of the 45,000-ton battleship as we sailed up and down the East Coast, inviting citizens to come aboard to view the spot where the peace treaty with Japan had been signed. When we sailed into Casco Bay and anchored in Portsmouth, Maine, I saw the first mountains I had seen since leaving North Carolina and I was homesick. There I received word that my father had typhus fever and was in critical condition. A knowledgeable neighbor had filled out papers for my mother to sign asking for a dependency discharge so that I could go home and harvest the crops and run the farm. At home again as my father recovered, I farmed for the next five years in addition, I took a correspondence course in training horses and boarded a few horses on the farm. After my father got his strength back, I worked for trainers of Tennessee walking horses and saddlebreds near Asheville and later at Hendersonville. I was proudest of my little mare, Copper, whom I trained in all five gates as well as a few dressage movements. In 1949, I looked around and most of my friends had left for work or college and I grew restless and planned to e enter nearby Western Carolina University. No one in high school or afterwards had ever suggested that I go to college, but when the director of the John C. Campbell Folk School, Marguerite Bidstrup, heard that I was going to the local university, she called me in and said that if I were going to college, I ought to go to Berea, an institution that primarily educated people from the mountains. There, she said, I would get a better education and meet people from all over the region, the country, and the world. Since I was a member of her folk dance team, we went to Berea for the Spring Dance Festival, where we acquired entrance papers and she administered certain tests. I was accepted and became a freshman at Berea in 1950 in the first integrated class since the day law was passed in 1904 
aimed at interracial Berea College that forbade blacks and white students to be educated together in Kentucky. Those years, I found my first black friends. I took the usual liberal arts courses, such as freshman and sophomore composition, Western civilizations, courses in math, science, Bible, philosophy, and a course called Humanities that gave me a taste of the visual arts, literature, and music. I eventually chose English as a major because I harbored thoughts of being a writer. Four teachers especially had an influence on me, Lester Pross in art, Emily Ann Smith and Jerry Hughes in English, and Gladys Jameson in music. However, perhaps the greatest influence was the mountain room in the library. This room contained all of the back issues of Mountain Life and Work, a quarterly magazine started by Berea College, and later to become the voice of an organization called the Council of the Southern Mountains. The collection, thanks to alert librarians, also held most of the books ever published about Southern Appalachia or by Appalachian writers. I spent many hours in this collection, and there I discovered such writers as Harriet Arno, Jesse Stewart, James Still, and Thomas Wolfe. This collection taught me much about my land and people. In 1954, I graduated from Berea with a degree in English and a minor in history. I am grateful for my Berea College education. Nancy and I had plans to marry and for me to enroll at the University of Kentucky for a master's in English. I also had an offer to work for the Council of the Southern Mountains located in Berea. But the draft board called and I wound up in the Army at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Nancy and I got married after basic training, but then I was sent to Fort Bliss, Texas for anti-aircraft artillery training and then to Japan and to the 1st Cavalry Division, part of U.S. security forces there. I was made an educational specialist for my battery with an office, a Japanese secretary, and a fairly good library. I taught a few classes arranged for soldiers to work toward and to be tested for their high school equivalents certificates. And I advised and arranged classes for officers seeking college or graduate degrees. I was stationed first at Hachinoe and then near Tokyo. I learned a great deal about Japanese people and their culture, and generally about the importance of differing cultures and their values. I made many photographs of Japanese people and places. That fall, I enrolled at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to study English. Nancy taught school to support us. I eventually earned a teacher's certificate and a master's degree, and we both taught for a year in the Jefferson County, Kentucky schools. Then Pearlie Ayer, executive secretary of the Council of the Southern Mountains, asked me to come back to Berea and run the organization while he studied rural sociology in preparation for courses he was to teach at Berea College. That year stretched into 12. During those early CSM years, our daughters Susan Ellen and Carol Elizabeth were born. Several years later, we adopted a third child, Scott. The council was founded by John C. Campbell and others in 1913 as a membership organization of mostly nonprofit, settlement, and religious schools, clinics, and colleges, and the workers at other social uplift agencies. It held an annual conference that brought such workers together to share ideas on solving problems in the region. As the associate director, I did administration and planned the annual conferences that featured both regional and national speakers. When the War on Poverty and National Private Foundations brought 
national attention and major funding to the region during the 1960s. The council acquired money and staff to do major work in the region, including the programs of the Appalachian Volunteers, the Community Action Technicians, the Manpower Development Staff, but also other programs for education, literacy, and health care. We also established annual workshops and two centers to promote urban adjustment of southern Appalachian migrants in northern cities. However, the war on poverty and the politics that evolved brought many tensions to the mountains and to organizations such as the council. And its membership and programs splintered. I resigned as executive secretary in 1970. The council ultimately became a casualty of the war on poverty. At that time, President Willis D. Weatherford invited me to join the staff of Berea College to start an Appalachian Center that the faculty had already approved. The center with a faculty staff advisory committee was charged with coordinating the Appalachian commitments of the college and representing the college in the region and elsewhere. Furthermore, the center would involve faculty, staff, and students in regional studies, assist in arranging appropriate regional courses, and organize special events to highlight the culture, problems, and opportunities of the Appalachian South. Professors Richard Drake of the History Department and Maureen Faulkner of the English Department were already teaching courses in Appalachian history and literature. I organized and the faculty approved two new courses, Appalachian Culture and Appalachian Problems and Institutions, that I would teach. And I later added uh, Appalachian Oral Traditions, Ballads and Tales for the January short term. Later on, we created additional courses that would fulfill the cultural area requirements of the time. Appalachian Community Analysis, Appalachian Music, and Appalachian Crafts. Next, we set up a committee on traditional music, including former radio and recording artists and authorities, such as Gene Ritchie, John Lair, Bradley Kincaid, and Buell Kazee. It planned the annual celebration of traditional music that has been showcasing exceptional musical artists from throughout the region for nearly 40 years. We also started the Appalachian Sound Archive of music, interviews, speeches, and stories that has recorded all of the annual festivals and added field recordings and donations from artists and collectors. It has, in addition, produced sound albums of traditional musicians and storytellers. This huge archive is now in the special collections at Hutchins Library and is being added to and digitized th through the World Wide Web. One of the most important programs we developed was the annual workshop in Appalachian Studies, History and Literature and sometimes Music with graduate credit from the University of Kentucky. We sought the best teachers we could find, Cratus Williams, Wilma Dykeman, Richard Drake, Pat Ware, Jim Wayne Miller, Gene Ritchie, and numerous others. We aim primarily at promoting Appalachian-related courses or emphases in the public schools and colleges of the region. To these workshops came many gifted teachers and scholars and several of them have become leaders in the Appalachian Studies Association and in scholarship about the region. I note also that the Appalachian Studies Association was formed with strong Berea leadership and its first annual conference was held in Berea. Billy Ed Wheeler, musician, songwriter, playwright, and I conceived of and presented four festivals of Appalachian humor to which we invited regional humorists and storytellers, as well as scholars of humor. These were well attended since people love to laugh and know that a humorous outlook helps in coping with adversity. 
Billy Ed and I subsequently published four volumes of regional humor that are still in print as well as one recording of humor. Other influential ventures were the Appalachian Center newsletter ably edited by Thomas Parrish, the annual Weatherford Award for the book that said it best for Appalachia, financed by Berea's Alfred Perrin, and the annual Berea College Service Award. As part of my work at the center, I did a lot of public speaking and lecturing throughout the region and elsewhere, at schools and colleges, at workshops and conferences, service clubs, churches, and any other group that wanted to hear about Berea College or Appalachia. I also published articles, reviews, and books on regional matters, such as values, problems, music, religion, and humor. I continued such efforts after my retirement in 1993. Well, these are some of the things we did in the early years of this center. It is gratifying to me that the center has grown in work and influence far beyond these early efforts through the strong support of three presidents, Willis Weatherford, John Stevenson, and Larry Shin, and of course through the imaginative and energetic work of the three distinguished directors who followed me, Dr. Helen Lewis, Dr. Gordon McKinney, and Dr. Chad Berry. <laughs>